Okay, hello everybody. How's everybody going? Welcome to the brutal capitalist dictatorship of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, you gentlemen want to introduce yourselves? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm Alistair. I run a YouTube channel. I mostly just post either long form content, do live streams, but I mostly, you know, I'm a bit more of a provocateur where I attack right wingers with kind of more politically incorrect content. And then I kind of bait them into an argument or something like that. But that's most of the content I do. Sometimes I talk about central planning. It's usually depending on whatever I feel like to, doing at that particular time. Okay. Thank you, Alistair. And what about you, Derek? Hey, I'm Derek. I'm a Black, more Irish, uh, communist, uh, working class guy. Uh, I do this educational content uh, with Rick mostly uh, on his podcast, Decolonize Buffalo. I also have my own podcast, Post Scarcity Podcast. And uh, we also, both of us work out of the anti, uh, Anti-Colonial Institute, International Anti-Colonial Institute. Um, is our newly formed uh, organization. And we, yeah, we just do anti-colonial education content. That's our thing. Thank you, Derek. And last but not least, what about you, Rick? Would you like to introduce yourself? I would not. Just kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I'm Rick. I am Comanche. I have a master's in native law here. And I run the podcast Decolonized Buffalo. And I talk about solar colonization within Mexico and the U.S. Mm. And you've received quite a lot of attention from the Hasbols, haven't you? Um, yes, I think you have. The The infrared gang have given you quite a bit of attention, haven't they? Yeah, they try, but they fail. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, gentlemen, today we are... What's our agenda for today's meeting? I huh? think I think your goal was to talk about um our our uh, points of view on these Pat Sox, patriarch socialists, settler nationalists, fascists, whatever you want to call them. They're the same thing. They're all the same thing. Well, I'd like to start this meeting in that case with this interesting photograph. You see, everybody sees this photograph. Yes. Okay. This is an yep. original press photograph of the Malayan communists from the nineteen seventies. Low contest. Can you see? Okay. It? And uh, yes. this was the first attempt of the Malayan working class, the Malaysian working class to seize power. It was the first attempt at the dictatorship of the proletariat. But one thing you might not be aware of is that you see these two gentlemen in the front row. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Where? Ah, here. You see these gentlemen? Yeah. These two are mm -hmm. actually Japanese. Their names are Shigeyuki Hashimoto and Kiyoaki Tanaka. And they were actually engineers who joined up after the war in order to wipe the disgrace off wicked Nippon. So basically, they were Japanese citizens who defected over to the communists, basically, to atone for what their country had done. You guys know what Japan did, of course. Um, horrible, horrible stuff. So that's why they... Um, basically, they were not patriots in a strict sense because they were... You know, like, remember we talked about revolutionary defeatism? Like, if your country is reactionary, it's your duty as a socialist to to stand against it, right? So I think we can we can progress from that point. What do you guys think? Anybody? Um, Derek? Oh, Rick? Rick, sorry. Yeah, so I think that's the issue we have here with these um, settler nationalists or these Pat Sox. Patriotic socialists, whatever they call themselves, um, is that they see revolutionary movement and revolutionary thought through the settler nationalist, mm. right? The, the American bourgeois nationalism, when that nationalism is illegit Ill illegitimate in the first place, right? It's a settler colonial. Um, so to liberate the hundreds of indigenous nations on this continent, mm -hmm. uh, we have to abolish all forms of settler colonization that includes settler nationalisms. So in for revolution to happen, we cannot hold or try to move, you know, or, or, you know, paint or try to shine up settler nationalisms through a Marxist lens. We have to abolish it. I mean, Stalin talks about, about it. Lenin talks about it. You know, we can't hold on to these things. But since these settlers don't know anything past their own, you know, 
experiences, they overlook the contradictions of settler colonization on this continent. So they, they don't understand decolonization in the first place. So it leads them to hold on to these, you know, uh, colonial biases, which makes them colonial chauvinist, settler, mm-hmm. settler chauvinist. And Lenin also talks about that. It's kind of an interesting parallel, like watching Jackson Hinkle and the infrared con- community. They kind of stick it up for Palestine, but at the same time, they're also trying to invoke a form of like American patriotism, which I mean, to be fair, you've already said yourself, but like the American project is a settler colonial project. And so it's kind of an interesting contradiction is because like there are some people who have been using the se- the argument that because America is like a settler colonial project, that it should also defend like defend Israel, which kind of puts like a lot of pat socks in a weird contradictory position. I'm kind of I've always wondered if whether or not there is like a form of patriotism that is even non chauvinistic in the West, because we're talking about, you know, patriotism from from uh, Western European countries, which have a 500 year history of settler colonialism. Whether that's possible, I don't know if that's the case. Most of the patriotic socialist projects I've seen thus far, like in the United States, have just ended up becoming some variant of like social chauvinism. Well, what they're supposed to do, right, is mm-hmm. uh, and not be another thing Lenin would have called them is annexationists, right? Yes. In his writings on imperialism, uh, what what is demonstrated in that photograph that Comrade Confucius shared with mm-hmm. us is revolutionary defeatism, which is what the principled line would be for a proletariat of an oppressor nation. So that's yeah. this is like <laughs> this is you know where. Jackson Hinkle and them, they 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 demonstrate their either disregard or uh, their intent to to subvert the basic Marxist principles, Marxist Leninist principles, which is like as as a proletariat of an oppressor nation, which would be the proletariat of Israel, the proletariat of in that case Japan. Mm. the proletariat of the United States, you know, a white proletariat in the United States, or even any really white proletariat in the world because of Mm -hmm. how the global hegemony works, it being a white supremacist global hegemony that is monolithic and includes Europe and its settler colonies. Yes. As a proletariat of these oppressor nations and settler colonies, many of them illegitimate nations, which are and, and not nations, they are annexations. Um, you're a principled communist would adopt revolutionary defeatism and and would want the defeat of their own nation and the, the victory. Of, they talked mm-hmm. about this with the British and the Irish. Um, you know, Marx first talked about that. Uh, the, the British were to be revolutionary would have to adopt revolutionary defeatism and would uh yeah it's it's really this is That's an fairly simple take. stuff this is like marxist leninism, leninism 101 and it it shows that these people are Shame. revisionists you could so, say or also you know just there's there's smalls. a contradiction between third worldism and classical marxism of where proletarian revolution was going to occur In classical Marxism, Marx, of course, predicted that proletarian struggle would happen in the most advanced capitalist nations is because these were already in the capitalist mode of production, places like Germany, France. He didn't have much hope for the English. I think he's actually spoke pretty low about like proletarian revolution and the Anglosphere, but he was more or less speaking at an, an inspiration of the Paris Commune. Now, it's kind of an interesting evolution of how we go for it. Oh, no, no. When I raise my hand, I'm, it's actually after oh. the person that's talking finishes. Oh. Don't right. rush me. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I'm not rushing me, but I'm saying don't don't rush my, my. yeah. It's, okay. uh, please, Alistair, please finish your. your, your okay. Okay. Yeah. We don't have to rush anything. Yeah. My mistake. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm kind of, yeah, I've been kind of just scrolling on something else, but, uh, so I can't really see the raised hand thing, but I'll definitely keep that in mind. But uh, so third worldism, more or less, like why, like when the Bolsheviks first had their revolution, when the Bolshevik revolution was really taking off, the Bolsheviks were kind of banking on the Spartacist revolution in Germany. You know, they were assuming that the Bolshevik revolution was going to inspire revolution across the world. The thing is, instead of the Spartacist revolution really succeeding or the revolutions in Germany, 
and you ended up getting the Nazis instead. You just had fascism, you know, take over most of Europe. And so most of the most of the revolutions ended up happening in the third world consequentially, even though the Bolsheviks were kind of assuming that the world revolution would carry off into Europe as well. I mean, you can even look at some of Trotsky's writings, but he wanted to more or less invade Europe at the time, which wasn't exactly feasible for Russia is because how backward and, you know, they just had gone through a five year civil war by 1923. And so third worldism kind of emerged as an as an as a kind of wondering why revolution didn't succeed in the first world or within the imperial course particularly the united states because it more or less inherited what the british empire had had in the uh, 19th century well into the 20th century and so i think this is a contradiction that a lot of communists need to kind of confront from an honest perspective this contradiction between classical marxism of where revolution is going to happen whether it's going to happen in the most developed you know capitalist nations or more or less the most uh, backward and oppressed nations in the third world which historically they have happened in the most backwards and and, and colonized third world countries russia was a backwards feudal society what had very little capitalist mode or capitalist production in the first place same with china cuba was probably the most advanced one when it came to the forces of production but uh, that's just something I'm throwing on the tables because I think that Marxists need to have an honest discussion about proletarian revolution within the third world or within the first world. Well, um, yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the the fact of the matter is that Marx lived in the 19th century and Lenin lived before the Second World War even happened. So um, a lot of the things they could not sure. have predicted because they don't have the benefit of retrospect. They really, they, they, yeah. they, 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 they lived, they, they could only predict based upon their observations in their own time period. So, um, you know, I think using dogmatic, Dogmatically clinging on to Marx's words or Lenin's words is, to me, a mistake that I see some uh, American very dogmatic socialists using. Basically, they 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 cling on to their words and they they really believe that America or rather the developed countries have more revolutionary potential than the global South, and they yeah. they seem to believe that. That's why the hat socks, your net yes. socks, let's call them net socks. Um, really seem to believe that America is going to get socialism. Some of them already believe America is in socialism. It's already in the socialist age. They believe that because they, they're they clinging on to this revolutionary tradition idea because Lenin did write a letter to the American workers and uh, he did tell them that the Americans have a revolutionary tradition in breaking the fetters of British imperialist rule and so these people, they cling on to that letter that was written by Lenin, and they use it as um, evidence that, uh, you know, that that patriotic American socialism is the way to go forward, because Lenin said so. But yeah. Lenin didn't see the rise of the American empire. He, he This was written in 1918, right? 1918, yeah. So yeah. Lenin could not have foreseen how America would progress in the next century i'm sorry alistair you or derek or um rick anybody wants to say something sorry i mean if you no does anyone else want to say i don't want to dominate the conversation sorry. yeah i do want to say some things okay so you uh comrade confucius you're right so this was something that um as marxist especially these past socks always used to work word dialectically right but mm -hmm. in uh that you know a dialectical materialism is made as a tool to help you analyze the world, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to analyze the contradictions here on this continent, which is, you know, quote unquote, North, quote unquote, America, is that, um, you know, stellar colonization is happening. So I always tell, you know, non native Marxists, <clears throat> if we transform this country into a Marxist country without addressing the contradictions, of settler colonization, then the, the, the state is still a settler colonial state, right? If you paint mm -hmm. the, the state red, it's still settler, settler colonial. It's not until we abolish settler colonization and have a decolonial state, because when you address settler colonization, you're also addressing capitalism. Mm -hmm. Capitalism does not become um, secondary. So there's many pillars within uh, settler colonization. What what these pat socks or these settler nationalists are doing is they're focusing only on only one pillar of settler colonization, which is the economic. They're not 
focusing on any other pillars, right? And that's the problem because telecolonization is not just economic. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would highly recommend for listeners to read uh, Eurocentrism in the Communist Movement by Robert Beale. I posted it on my share drive. It's, it's you know you can you can you know read it yourself, and it talks about how um, these Western Marxists have been so dogmat dogmatic and against revisionism that they become the revisionists themselves. Ironic, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. because they are doing copy and paste style yeah. of Marxism. It also yeah. talks about how after Lenin dies, after he died, that the the world. The communist movements around the world move towards a Eurocentric, uh, uh, Eurocentric mm -hmm. vision of communism, and that's mm -hmm. problematic. See, in decolonization, you know, we, if, when you put indigenous epistemologies, when you front load them, that becomes, you know, that changes the obviously the mathematical equation within dialectical materialism, and it helps improve it, right? And it fights against revisionists itself, right? So. Yeah. You know, when we talk about this is where like Marxist, I think, on in the West are lacking is that they're not reading anything past maybe like Mao. <laughs> so I, <laughs> right? think, mm -hmm. I, I think like classical Marxism is also a bit Eurocentric as well, mm -hmm. because Marx predicted that a lot of these revolutions had happened in the most advanced capitalist nations. But if you look at most of the revolutionary movements, and I'm going to be kind of an ass about MAGA comms right now is that they're mostly petite bourgeois people that are upset about the internationalization of capital capitalism, more or less. And so their class position is inherently threatened by global trade, global, global uh, capitalism, is because, again, when you have like global capitalism and global competition, a lot of the American labor aristocracy, is, especially Western labor aristocracy, is threatened by multinational capitalism. You know, you could say this is like obviously a more progressive thing is because it essentially proletarianizes like the Western working class, you know, with the internationalization of capitalism. But nonetheless, like the kind of like fascist backlash is against this kind of internationalization, the petite bourgeois and the labor aristocracy having their class position threatened by multinational capitalism and, and uh, capitalist like uh, multinational corporations, which explains like why they hate globalism. Don't you find it very, very disingenuous that they're saying, if you stand against MAGA, you are against the American working class. Whereas there are tons yes. and tons of American working class people who are not in MAGA, who might be LGBT, who might be even Democrat, believe it or not. So are they saying that only MAGA counts as working class people, but Jackson Hinkle will go even a step further and, and start to cast doubts as to whether... LGBT can be counted as working class people as opposed to imperialist <laughs> agents, you know. Um, you yeah. Know, what he said, if you're a homosexual, if you're a poor, <laughs> if or if you're a satanic subhuman filth, I yep. wouldn't be surprised if you support imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only, only, you know, that's what I, I was telling a couple of my progressive friends about this. I was, I, I told them, I was like, it doesn't matter if you're you support like rainbow capitalism or like pa or you support Palestine, right? You know, social reactionaries are just going to have a problem with your existence no matter what. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and so like that's kind of thing. Like here, like they'll accuse uh, like LGBT people or progressive people of quote unquote supporting rainbow capitalism, uh, you know, because they're like they basically try and push them out of like you know re revolutionary movements. And then when they support revolutionary movements like Palestine, right? There's no shortage of reactionaries saying, "Oh, uh, queers for Palestine, they hang gay people." Like you just can't win. And so, you know, you have to choose authentically which side you're going to take. And obviously I'm going to say you probably should support the revolutionary struggle. Hmm. Well, it's about what contradiction it's primary, right? And Absolutely. In that case, it's the settler colonialism. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of to our point. That's some, that's something we uh, try to reinforce consistently in our education is that, colonialism is like we the uh these pat socks by the way there's this whole sphere of grifters uh, demagogues uh you know internet personalities organizations and leaders of organizations like we're people that we're talking about are like this is cpi midwestern marks um, yeah you know like there's the, these people are organized um uh they they argue that they 
they make an abstraction. They they say that the the primary contradiction is United States imperialism, and they they're abstracting United States imperialism from the larger system that it exists within, which is European colonialism. The United States collaborates with the entire NATO sphere. Yes. With and all of the NATO affiliated countries, it doesn't exist by itself. And to and the fact that the way they compartmentalize it, it's very it's very intentional. They do it for a reason to obscure reality to make it like this, you know. And and they love to you know focus on when you know cap in capitalist imperialism does uh, does recruit from you know oppressed groups like you know gay people lgbtq black and brown people um black but you know a black there's disproportionately more black and indigenous people in the army because of the po- poverty draft and all yeah. of that so it's like that works in their favor they that that's good propaganda you know with it, with them subverting why that that happens they get to paint uh these oppressed groups and these oppressed groups movements as yes. imperialists like it's we we get called imperialists like we we get fed jacketed but we also yeah. get called uh imperialists because we you know they associate whenever we talk talk about decolonization they will try to associate us with the united states subverting what colonialism is in 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 its attempts at uh imperialism such as in xinjiang and in mm. uh, Tibet and Taiwan, mm. um, that's obviously the, the way the United States talks about it. De- decolonization is uh, completely like completely warped. It's not uh, it's not at all what uh, they they have a completely inaccurate um, yeah uh, yeah inaccurate analysis. Yeah, there, there's a there's a dichotomy at least formatting in the West, and it's kind of more or less tapping into this whole thing. Is because when I was going to debate Destiny, I was kind of expecting him to straw man me as being an ignorant dipshit progressive leftist who was going to support or like Islamic fundamentalist. He ended up not pulling that card, probably because I basically disavowed it within the first five minutes of the debate. But there's a false there's a dichotomy kind of coming about within the West, and I'm just speaking as on behalf of the West at this point is. You know, this this dichotomy between being more pro- progressive and being uh, a social or like a social reactionary populism camp and the infrared community kind of really taps in in this dichotomy of uh, more or less like right wing social conservative populism versus uh, versus like a progressive neoliberal imperialism. And, you know, the thing is, you have on one camp with like Destiny, uh, maybe even Vosh to some degree of, you know, these people are backward Islamic fundamentalists. And, you know, it's it's kind of like tagging the line of Christopher Hitchens, where these people are backward, uh, savage Islamic fundamentalists and need to be civilized uh, by the liberal Anglo world. And, you know, yeah, and so basically, like the infrared community kind of taps into this by kind of fulfilling the stereotype of painting the global south as all inherently social reactionaries. And I think I talked with you about that a little bit that, on that uh, uh, Comrade Confucius. We had like a little talk about that on Twitter we where did. you were talking. Yeah, you were, you were basically pointed out that you didn't like how a lot of the MAGA comms were painting the global south as inherently social reactionary. And I think this is a very intentional dichotomy that people are trying to foment where where you it, like if you support like the global south and you're anti settler colonialism, you're obviously like a, a social reactionary or something like that. You call that out very well. Uh, thank you. You know, guys like Douglas Kim, for example, I I can't mm-hmm. uh, I can't imagine why anyone would think that guys like that would represent the typical person of the global south. He's rude. You know, Douglas Kim. Yes, yeah. I know. He's rude, abusive, <laughs> nasty, and yet he tries to position position himself as the true voice of the Asian community around the world, even though he would be hated by most people in Asia if he came back. And he calls me whitewashed for some strange reason. <laughs> and uh, even though he, he's he got more, he, he mixes around with guys like Haas and Hinkle and he's basically, you know, they they this, this deliberate positioning of the global South, as Alistair said, to as inherently reactionary, I think is... Um, is basically to fulfill their own desires in the sense that if they want to move back to the global south someday, this is my theory, 
at least they mm -hmm. that they want it to be like um right wing American 1950s kind of world. That's what they would like the global south to be. And they get very annoyed and frustrated when they meet global south socialists like me who say, hey, we're not on with your bullshit. We don't you we don't agree with because you know I'm part of the Party Party Socialist Malaysia. I'm part mm -hmm. of the Socialist Party of Malaysia. And we have LGBT comrades, we have gay comrades, yeah. and we 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 are a safe space, you know. If anybody were to try bullying our homosexual comrades, they'd get expelled from the party. We refuse to even work with transgender um people. As that's to say, not we're not talking about, you know, correcting the false consciousness of the working class, but let's say we we had a chance to collaborate with a transgender public figure. We actually declined such uh, opportunity mm -hmm. because it would reflect poorly upon our party. And yet I was told by some of the Haas gang and the, the Douglas Kim or Jackson Hinkle gang that I wear a social chauvinist party because we we, we won't work with transphobes or homophobes. <sighs> yeah, no, they'll get mad about that. But that's kind of the funny thing being in the West. You know, I always get to hear from like people like this from the CPG BML or no shortage of more of the reactionary commun communists will say, well, you know, the CPSU and all these different communist parties are all like, you know, super social reactionary. You're just, uh, you know, if you support gay rights or trans rights, you know, you're the one that's weird and you're basically just doing, uh, you know, uh, American neoliberalism, which is kind of ironic that, you know, the infrared people, the Pat Sox and the CPG BML will basically, you know, with a broad paintbrush, go over the global south to say, OK, well, we need to be social reactionaries over this, you know, just like this perceived image of the global south. Mm. But yeah, it's kind of like with Julius Malema. The, the infrared community loves Julius Malema, but he's actually very socially progressive. He's given <laughs> multiple speeches about he supports gay rights and trans rights. And he's not a, and he's not very. He doesn't couch his language about colonizers. <laughs> they, either, yeah, so they, yeah. They'll call it's like, very, I think they like to ignore that, or but they think that they're not the equivalent of boars, which is really yeah. funny because it's like. Like they're trying to kill the boar, and you are the boars in our situation. So I don't, I don't see why. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it seems antithetical to what you're peddling. Yeah, no, it, but you got you got the little stereotypes of you know it's the Western communists. If you're a progressive, you're the odd one out compared to all the other real communist movements who were, uh, you know, social reactionaries throughout all history. Which, which it, it's the ironic part. It's got to such a degree that I called Chris, uh, Chris Morlock out on Twitter, where he was basically <laughs> sharing like a video by uh, by Haas. He's like, you know, and, and I'm not against religion. So like nobody mistake me in saying I'm, I'm against religion, right? But I'm also anti-historical revision. He's saying communists were in fact so religious that it went without saying that they believed in God. And I was like, are, are you going to pretend like the Bolsheviks weren't like borderline at, right, at, right at atheists when they were going after like the Russian, like the Orthodox Church? Because it was actively a tool for the czar and a lot of people had a bad taste in the mouth, right? You could kind of get away with saying Joseph Stalin may have been a homophobe because there's actual historical evidence. Mm -hmm. But well, it's yeah, just straight up. The clergy, basically. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, you know, they very much were like borderline Reddit atheists. Don't try to give me this historical revisionist shit. Give it a couple of months and, you know, eventually they're going to come back saying, well, actually, the real anti Semites were Stalin and the communist. Hitler was actually secretly Jewish. <laughs> Just give it a yeah, couple they, of months. Hinkle said Hitler was gay, actually. And that's that's yeah. dehumanizing for gay people, actually. Yeah. <laughs> they just keep going further right and then calling it communist. <laughs> but there's a Chris Morlock tweet that I want to show you. Um, Ratings you, guys talking, you guys go ahead. I'm looking for it. Uh, Rick, you've um, had your hand up for a while. Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to their bigotry, especially their transphobia and homophobia, it comes from their, their what was the term that, that you used, Derek? Social conservatives, mm -hmm. right? And it goes back to their Eurocentric view because they, they go, they, this is why Hinkle and Eddie are promoting this like Christian Marxist perspective. Right, like, oh, you can be a, a Christian and a Marxist because they want to hold on to pieces of colonization into the next stage of society. You know, so th this is why they're homophobic. This is why they're they're transphobic, right? When in reality, and they try to paint, you know, indigenous cultures as like conservative here on this continent, but we're not because we have words and our languages for people that were trans we had people we had lgbt people in in our communities we had we had uh you know uh 
know, like poly amory type of marriages with different people, you know, many different wives or many different husbands, right? These are the colonial styles of relationships we have. Like, so for them to, to, um, force their Eurocentric vision of one man, one woman style of marriage is a very, it's again, very colonizing for us. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. for them to, for them to push this, this narrative, it's not liberating for us. It's, it's further oppression. Right. Well, mm-hmm. Go ahead. That's kind of the interesting thing is because like, if anybody's read the origin of family and property, which God forbid, I don't think the Emperor community will ever do is because it's going to have some pretty yikesy things that they're not going to want to hear. But Marx actually talked about the primitive communist family likely being polyamorous is because there's no way to actually test for paternity. And so, you know, child rearing was largely communitarian. And so but the thing is, is like the, the infrared community kind of don't recognize that the, the family unit is something that is historical. It changes with each mode of production. But, you know, now that you mentioned like colonial efforts, th- th- that's kind of an interesting one is because, you know, you, there's actually a split in the political right within the West between like the feudal family. And this, of course, this goes into reactionary socialism between the feudal family and more or less the nuclear family that came about because of the Industrial Revolution and uh, and Western capitalism. You know, Alistair, I just uh, I'm just going to add to you and Rick's uh, analysis a little bit. Like uh, they they talk about the nuclear family as if we've been doing it for thousands of years. Like, but as you say yeah. in Engels's book, you know, he mentions that the nuclear family is a very modern, recent introduction, which is basically the product of the new age means of production, which is capitalism, right? But these Mm -hmm. infrared people say it is traditionalism and it's popular American values as if the Asian multi-generational family were not traditional. You know, they, they, and it's funny because Douglas Kim also thinks that Asian families are supposed to be nuclear as opposed to multi-generational, meaning three generations in one house. So obviously he, he has no idea what he's talking about. Um, the these people want to have their cake and eat it because they're comfortable yeah. with the status quo in a way. Um, of course, they would like to have better material conditions, no doubt. Of course, they would like to have better um, material conditions. But by and large, they want the superstructure to remain, how do we say, un, for the most part, unblem, unchecked. or not, not Unchanged, unchecked, yeah. What's the word for it? Can you guys help me out here? They want the unchanged. superstructure to be unchanged, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's kind of the interesting thing is because when you call them out on this sort of stuff, right, they'll tell you that they're being scientific. I got my, my biggest laugh was when Chris Gorlock was calling me a glowy because <laughs> I agree with Paul Cox shot on his takes of economics and central planning. But I was a glowy because I didn't agree with his takes on gay people, which, you know, to be fair, he is a social reactionary in that aspect because he did a couple of like blog posts about how gay people are inherently bourgeois. But apparently, according to Chris Gorlock, that was his best study. Not any of his stuff actually having to do with Marxist economics, a self-identified marxist leninist but uh his studies on gay people is his most important critical work to these people which just kind of baffled me that he called me a glowy for that one chris morlock is a very interesting character he says the wildest shit you know he he even yeah. made fun of my accent he said he, he asked me to decolonize my accent he said if you are you keep talking about decolonization why don't you decolonize your accent I can't decolonize my accent. <laughs> yeah, this might be a way a, a variant of English you learned. <laughs> it's like okay. as, yeah. as if the American English is like less of a colonizer language. Right? Yeah, oh my god, uh, no, but, it is the colonizer yeah. language because it is a colonial project. Yeah, <laughs> he wants me to sound like this. Rick, now. I okay, think, I can I think Rick, he wants Asian people to sound like this, right? This is how he wants people in a global south to sound. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, have you to know. have a super thick accent, or it's not yeah. legit. <laughs> yeah, some people get a little bit mad at me when I just start insulting him, and you know, just basically because, like, the thing is, let's get back down to like what they do to us, like all the dang time. You know, you have a d- genuine discussion. The insults come out. They just start talking down to you, and then when you start insulting them back, they get all butt hurt and complain, like, "Why are you being such a bully?" Like. You started this. Why would you? Why are you getting mad? You can't. You'd like to dish it out, but you can't take it. Thank and God. so, like, they always get mad at me. Like, Reb came into my Discord server when I was basically retweeting Johnny Socialism, and I posted that barista meme. You know, because I, I like to bait them every once in a while by putting out like a tweet. You know, like I'd take some like purple haired like barista chick and put it next to like some like super over masculine guy and say one is working class and one is an uh, one isn't. Because it always sends the right wingers like in a tizzy whenever they see like Emily A. Cab and like some like picture next to some burly man. And I just say like one is working class and one is not. It always like gets them like to like boost the tweet. But uh, Rev came into my voice chat for one of my streams and uh, 
He was getting really upset about that one. And it, it's, Matt Singh, it, right? Matt yeah. Singh. <laughs> I, know I still have that stream on my channel. That was the funniest thing. They raided my stream chat. They raided my, tried to raid my server. It's like, you know, if you, that's why I say like, you know, if you're going to go after right wingers, this is why I say I'm more of a politically incorrect content creator. You just got to start hitting their sacred cows. Like I went viral on delusional L's because I basically started attacking small business owners. And, uh, <laughs> like the thing is, is they don't respect any of the sacred cows of the left. You might as well just like go and enter their sacred cows, whether <laughs> you believe it or not. <laughs> I don't have a problem inherently with small business owners, but the thing is, is like I know that that's going to set them off. You know, it's like me and Chad Tifa on our way to bully the small business owner, <laughs> and then they get so angry at that. Yeah, yeah them. You know that. Yeah, before, before we get too far away from it. um I think Rick raised his hand went right around when I was going to like oh, just a. Uh, I I think it's a good chance to just like uh, when people and it's relevant to um, mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about Eurocentrism and everything, uh, when we talk about Engels uh, origin mm -hmm. of the family, um, there's a lot behind that that a lot of people don't know uh, him, that went into him writing that book and him mm -hmm. uh, drawing from early anthropologist uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, right, Rick? Um, uh, anyway, it's uh, so it's like very yep. derivative of the Haudenosaunee Great Law of Peace, um, mm -hmm. and it's just an Orientalized kind of version. Basically, like Engels, first of all, is like was like very very racist. Like he was like definitely mm -hmm. of Marx and between he and Marx, he was much more chauvinist. Um, Kevin B. Anderson writes that great book about it. Uh, Marx Mar at the margins. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of writing about that to help people. Uh, I just thought it was a good chance to, and I think that's uh, Rick was. I'm sure you'd want to elucidate on that as well. Yeah, so boy, it, you know, Kevin B. Anderson kind of covers the same thing uh, that Robert Beale does in Eurocentrism and the Communist Movement. I think the uh, Robert Beale's book is better, right? Mm -hmm. A lot better than uh, Kevin B. Anderson's. I do want to say, if you look at page one. The first sentence of The Wretched of the Earth from Francis Fanon, it says decolonization is a violent event, right? The very first sentence. But later on in, in the same chapter, it talks about how Marxism has to be stretched, right? And this is done by using the colonial theory, right? And I think this is where uh, these, these, you know, past talks and uh, the show come in. I don't really think consider them as Marxists. I really don't think debating them is a good idea. I it's really do think, yeah, I do think educational content is is more is better yeah. to, to fight against these people. This is why when I address them on Twitter, I address them or I, I address them, but I post why they're where they're wrong. Just kind yeah. of like when Noah from Nick Western Marx um debated Matt from CP USA. Noah said a lot of racist shit, a lot of like ignorant shit. Like this is basic native 101. And you, you have to understand. So when I was I've been overseas a couple of times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, abroad. A lot of people outside of the US, outside of the North American continent, actually believe that there are no more indigenous peoples on this continent. Like I've been to places yeah. where people said, oh, you guys still exist? Yeah, we still exist. Yeah. So you have to think about how how hard that is for me to, to imagine trying to get solidarity abroad from, you know, with especially within Europe, you know, or anywhere else where they think that we don't exist. So I think the, the number one thing is that, and you know, let alone Americans themselves. I've heard that from Americans themselves, white Americans. Oh, Native Americans still exist? Yes, we do exist. Except they live in a uh, such a colonial structure where they don't even see us as, as existing, these settlers, right? So let alone learn about the history of their own, of this own continent of the, you know, the U.S. or Canada or Mexico, or let alone understanding the material conditions of our people as indigenous communities, indigenous, indigenous nations. There are, a lot of settlers don't even know we have, we have sovereignty in this country. We have our own governments. We have our own laws. We have our own police departments. We have our own fire departments we have our own infrastructures we have our own economies right and for example right i'll give, I'll give one one example so our economies as native american native you know indigenous nations 
our all of our economies are nationalized. Nobody in this in the in the nation in these Native American communities own owns these economies. They're owned communally still to this day, right? So this this economy funds programs like the Comanche Nation. I'm Comanche. It funds programs. We have over a hundred programs to to help citizens of the Comanche nations. This is socialism. Right, we're still collectivist. doing Sorry, collectivism. Yeah, yeah. Like well, Europeans had to rediscover collectivism. They had some early forms of it, but that's really what Marx and Lenin, so, so Marx and Engels are doing. Like, yeah, rediscovering. See, yeah. Right, yeah. Wait, I, I'm not done. Wait, wait. So mm -hmm. I, do, I do want to say, um, you, you know, and I'll give another example. Like people don't realize, like the Hard Rock Cafe, Hard Rock Cafe is global, and as native, there's a one native nation that owns that communally. Right. So we we do have economies, but these are, you know, you you as settlers don't understand that we exist. Right. They just come to our casinos like, oh, they have or casinos. They're oh, they're just, they're just racist as fuck. Right. But our economies also hire not if we have to hire non-indigenous to, to maintain. So we also hire non-indigenous peoples, right? And you know, we we, we donate to the communities, mm -hmm. you know, the local communities. We don't we actually build local infrastructures that non-natives use. So native so settlers you actually benefit from from us becoming stronger. So when people think about, you know, I always tell people this, I've been saying this for years. Imagine if the US government just collapsed because the Soviet Union's government just collapsed just like that, you know? So let, let's say you just collapse economically and you know, just like the Soviet Union's, we as the indigenous nations have the infrastructure to keep going. We yeah. do. We have we have the infrastructure to keep going and move this country forward. The problem is there's two problems. One, sellers don't know we exist. Two, white nationalist organizations are going to fuck some shit up. And that's yeah. dangerous. That's scary as fuck. I think the left needs to realize that we as indigenous nations, if, if, I'll give, for example, right? The Navajo Nation is almost 300,000 strong in their Ooh. nation, right? Mm -hmm. They, their economies, their infrastructure far surpasses any communist party that has ever existed in the U.S., the mm -hmm. economy, because everything I said before, laws, you know, all this stuff, all all these different, you know, aspects Talk of an dual power. Yeah, dual. So yeah. Would you so, would you support like a Soviet of nationalities? I this is like such high like speculation at this point, so, but like giving like land back and doing like a Soviet of nationalities for like yes, the new that, United States. That's where I'm going. So okay. my vision of decolonization is a, as an indigenous Senate, where there's one representative of each indigenous nations in in that Senate, right? Then mm -hmm. you have also seats for a new Africa. Right, the New Africa mm -hmm. is from the the people, the Africans that were brought here forcefully through yeah. colonization, that were stripped of their culture, stripped of their identities, and they have nowhere to go. Right, they're not settlers. They're not settlers yeah. at all. They are also an internal colony. Right, because mm -hmm. if you have to understand what, um, even the Spanish did this, they they moved indigenous from Mexico into the Philippines. And you know, and vice versa from from Mexico into the Caribbean, and vice versa. So the, the settlers were smart. They were stripping indigenous peoples of their of their communities and their languages, you know, and their and their consciousness into different places globally, to to so they couldn't you know revolt, right? Yep. So 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 the, the British did the same thing, you know, with the slave trade, and you know, and the Dutch and all these other European countries, they did the same thing. They all did the same tactics. You know, so I think divide you know, and rule. It's a, it's literally yeah. like written, and it's like a playbook. The 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 early uh the early schools, the early universities in mm. Europe were colonial administrators. It's where colonial administrators would yeah. learn yeah. to so, ad administrate the colonies. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Derek. Um, the the next thing is so there's an there's an Decolonial Senate, when there's one representative from each indigenous nation, that's going to be over a thousand seats. Because on this continent, you have to think about Canada, you have to think about the U.S. The U.S. has 574 indigenous nations itself, right? That mm -hmm. doesn't include the, the indigenous nations that are not recognized, or the, some state ones are, you know, that's a different conversation. Some are legitimate, some are not. But, and then there's Mexico. And I counted, for my count, around 1,200 indigenous nations just on this continent, Right. So people always ask, always ask me, 
what about sellers? What do they go? So the thing is, and Eddie made a video about this. He accused me of saying sellers should go back to Europe. I never said that. Sellers should stay here. I believe they should have uh, they should have a, a, a communist party, but the communist party cannot maintain power. The power goes to the indigenous Senate. They don't get a state. Right. It's, yeah. like it's about don't who get a gets state. a state and who gets mm -hmm. a nation. Like Israelis so, don't get a state, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, so that's Israelis, the whole point of settler colonialism. If, if, if Palestine, you're not indigenous, you don't get a state. What what's her so, name? Uh, Leila Khaled said that during one of her interviews back back in the seventies and the sixties, they asked her, you know, what about Israeli settlers if Palestinians get Palestinians, you know, Palestine gets liberated. She said they can stay, but they have to respect our authority. Same reason here. So the settlers can stay on this continent, but they would have to respect the authority of the indigenous Senate, mm -hmm. right? So the indigenous Senate is, is you know, also maintains the sovereignty of each individu individual indigenous nations. And of course, you know, there's a concept that Klee Benali, he's the author of No Spiritual no spiritual surrender. He's uh, out there in Navajo, right? And uh, there's a term that they use called become unknown. And that's something with decolonization. We don't know what, it, you know, we don't know like what's going to happen because it's unknown. We have to invent it as we go. But what we do know is that we have to abolish seller colonization, you know, but sellers get to stay here. I believe they do get representation. They just don't get supreme state federal representation, right? They're not going to be that. oppressed. They're going to, they have rights. They have the rights to housing. They have rights to medical. They have rights to education, you know, and I, I really do feel, I'm going to say this right now. And I've said this before, I really believe the last place on earth that's going to be liberated is going to be Europe. Because that, that's where this is. Yeah, it's very clear. <laughs> people are the was, worst in revolution, honestly. No, but no, not <laughs> th because it's the, the, the European powers are in solidarity with each other to colonize the world. And they also have to be liberated, right? So that, and I think that Europe has to be liberated when we know slowly the world becomes uh, liberated from, you know, Eurocentric, Eurocentric, uh, uh, grasp on the world mm -hmm. but i do think europe has to be uh disarmed they have to be disarmed for like a good like a 500 years or something it's been 500 years of non-stop genocide on the world by this but the euro but the europe powers they have to be disarmed it, i'm not saying hurt them i'm saying they have to be disarmed and it build their society. The word, yeah, you pass, you know, you so the world can build up and not worry about being genocided, just like we are now. The U.S. is running around the world with the European powers. Every time there's a conflict, the you know the only people that vote for U.S. imperialism are other European powers or Japan. Yeah, uh, Japan is the one odd man out. You know, he's like the uh, basically the house slave of all the Asia. The white man of Asia, right? The yeah. white man of Asia. That's right. They've had so many Japan's opportunities interesting. to get on the right side of history, but they keep they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity to get on the right side of history. You know, um, but speaking of yeah, speaking of settlers, you know, people like Eddie Eddie Liga Smith. Um, I think like was it Derek or Rick was saying that you know he he was accusing you guys of wanting to genocide the white people right like or to cut, kick them out of uh, of of uh, yeah. America just like a second Nakba so to speak it's uh it's projection on their part because it's what their ancestors did I, I no Ed disrespect to him but I mean I'm not saying he should be held mm -hmm. to to this he should be held responsible for what his ancestors did but they are basically projecting what they think their ancestors would do if you know yeah. you know what i mean that so it's a uh... eddie midwestern marks i'm gonna be completely a little bit honest like i used to like midwestern marks because i kind of saw him straddling the kind of like middle point between like more of the progressive side of the aisle but also like you know kind of keeping like the infrared people but he's been like he did, he did like one video recently midwestern marks did a video about like how andrew tate represents the working ah. class it was ah, getting ah, really ah, yeah pathetic. that one yeah so, yeah that, that. I was thinking about that as well. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Alistair, <laughs> yeah, no, he just progressively like I, I ended up getting blocked by Noah Krakovich uh, because he. <laughs> but, yeah, I was like, I'm not like, okay, dude, you already sound like a fucking smoker that's been smoking for like 50 years, dude. You sound like a grandpa at like 30. But uh, basically, we had got an argument on Twitter is because 
Uh, I think like Eddie was basically saying that uh, the deep state is committing lawfare against Trump and that we need to stand up for Trump or some stupid shit. A lot of people were calling him out on this bullshit. He's like, why should we be invested in this sort of stuff? And I just said straight up, I was like, what, like, why would we be invested in saving like another element of the bourgeoisie? Like, how does this exactly benefit us? And uh, Noah Krakovich basically came in and chimed in. He was like, you know, some people just have Trump derangement syndrome. And I'm like, excuse me, dude. I was like, I was like, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm asking you why you want me to actually like support Trump in this kind of a quote unquote lawfare campaign. Right. And he had like a little bit of a melt meltdown about like so many people that were unfollowing him on Twitter and YouTube at like, why are you surprised about this? Like you talk down to like more of the progressives on the side of the aisle. Right. And then you basically like treat your like fucking conservative fans like babies. Okay. You basically like, you know, hold them and like nurture them and you're still kind of them, but then you'll just basically talk. I got talked down by like Noah crack of it. He was like, Oh, uh, you just have Trump derangement syndrome. I was like, dude, I voted for Donald Trump in 2016. Like I bet Buck was a libertarian. Do you think you're like kind of projecting on the progressives like a little bit too much? And he was like, no, you just hate Trump is because you're just like a blue haired, like triggered SJW person. I was like, like, this is how far your head is up your own ass. You just don't even listen to the other side. You just talk mm -hmm. down to anybody. That's, who the, that's the irony, though. That's the irony, though, because the, these, uh, you know, <laughs> settler, these, these, like these settlers, bitch. yeah, the, these settlers would um, accuse another person of, you know, being like hyper focused on identity politics by white supremacy it's the original identity politics. Yeah. What the fuck? They're yeah. the ones that with the original identity politics, they're the ones that are forcing people, that force people into the Euro Christian, Euro version of society, mm. you know. Of, <laughs> of, you know. So to me, you know, for, for them to accuse people of that and then turn around and, yeah. and then accuse people of like purity fetishisms. Exactly. That's exactly but they, they're the, they won't even listen. Ask Noah which indigenous author they have ever read about decolonization. Have they even read Fanon? <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be honest. The first page, the first sentence, Fanon says, like I said before, decolonization is a violent event. Like no. So obviously, or, or even Walter Rodney, decolonial Marxism, right? So yeah. it's, it's this basic, basic things. They always use quotes, misuse quotes. They use like Lincoln quotes, like Abraham Lincoln. But like Abraham Lincoln let, uh, it was like 38 Lakota men to be hung, like a mass hanging, right? Yeah. And to me, I find that fucking weird that, you know, this guy's a fucking, all, all U.S. presidents are settler colonial presidents. Yeah. All of them. Right, so yeah. I, that's that's the aspect that they these people like have. They were all the too. They weren't even just like kind of doing colonialism. Like they're all like a lot of them. Like you know, we're just saying like eugenic stuff about indigenous yeah. people. It's not even like Howard Confucius called this best out. Races. Like when he <laughs> called them out on their double standard of purity fetishism. Thanks, Hectop, for the follow. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, no, like you called it out best, Comrade Confucius, with the purity fetishism. It's purity fetishism when we criticize them, but yeah. when like right wingers say you can't be LGBTQ and communist, that's not that's not purity fetishism. Yeah. Thanks for the follow, Canetheus. No worries. They always they always always have one standard for us and one standard yep. for their friends. So if it's their friends being the worst purity fetishist, like. It, I, it, can anyone seriously say that Douglas Kim is not a purity fetish? He, he goes around with the white male Asian female mind virus nonsense and he, he attacks everyone who disagrees with him and he yep. treats them as an enemy of the people if they happen to disagree with him. And, and Noah is there defending people like Douglas Kim and saying, you know, the left, that's why nobody likes the left, because they have a purity oh, fetish. Thanks, and they, don't, they won't work with people they deem socially conservative. That's why nobody likes them. So they hold the hands of their friends, you know, like their right wing friends. If they happen to get along with them, they will hold their hands. But at the same time, Midwestern Marx has another Thanks, standard RDB. for left winger people or have, has another standard for other people that they don't get along with. Oh, let me put it this way. They have an, another standard for people who are not their friends. So Midwestern Marx is basically a crony socialist party, a crony communist party, because they they have they are biased towards their friends, even though and they will they will accuse everything that their friends do is what they accuse you of. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. What I, eventually I, I, got him to block me was uh basically after you kept accused talking down to me. I was like, you know, I was like, all right, Noah 
the Noah Kukovich, okay? You're a carpenter, right? Get the stick out of your ass. I understand the fact I voted for him in 2016. So stop projecting your blue-haired, like, SJW woman on everybody who disagrees with you. But it is absolutely a double standard. And of course, he blocked me after that one. Uh, no. I think I think the issue is, too, is, you know, these Midwestern marks, people, especially everybody, is that they want people that agree with them. They want yeah. echo chambers. And... Yep. You know, Eddie Eddie made a post uh, this this week or last the end of last week where where Eddie said that um, he spoke to me and he explained basic Marxism to to me and that I told him all I wanted was a race war. First off, let's break that down. Eddie break Eddie explaining to me basic Marxism. I've been a Marxist for twenty years. How old was Eddie twenty years ago? <laughs> right, <Yeah, so. laughs> he was probably in diapers. I doubt Eddie has read as much shit than I, than I have. Two, right? I have never spoken to Eddie in my life. I keep telling Eddie on Twitter. If any follow, anybody, if anybody follows Rick from the Comics Buffalo on Twitter, they will see. I've been asking Eddie when have we spoken, Eddie? Because I have never spoken to you in my life. And three, like I've never told anybody I wanted a race war. If I always told people decolonization is also for settlers on this continent, is yeah. you know, people have to read indigenous authors that speak about decolonization. If you don't read if you don't read them, then you're not gonna understand decolonization. You know, decolonial theory, you know, is very complex. I mean, people Marxism. It, I won't say it's too complex, but you you do have to read Marxist yeah. theory. You do have to read Marx. You have to read, uh, uh, you know, Lenin and Mao and Stalin to really understand it. But for decolonial theory, it's so spread out around the world because realistically, those people that are decolonial theorists yeah. are 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 um addressing the material conditions in their own situation. Yes, right. So you have to understand. You have to read like. Uh, Derek has pointed out Luwazi Lushaba from South Africa, right? With who he is, right, Derek, a part of the EFF. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly funny. what I was about to bring up. Like, he's using they the same like... rhetoric that they used against the EFF and Julius Malema. They're like, and Wokeness did like a tweet saying, like, there are four million white people in South Africa and they're being actively genocided by the EFF. That's like, yeah, you're yeah. using the same language against anyone who's supporting decolonial uh, efforts in the West that are being used against Julius Malema. But, you know, do you think they're going to pay attention to that? Like, you know, no, no copying the language no yeah but i think i think you know as derek pointed out that luasi lushaba uh he pointed out before he left twitter it's very good some it's something really good to go on youtube you so you know to search on youtube and listen to his lectures and listen to his interviews right there's decolonial theories everywhere you know and some of them create other and helps it grow you know, and this is what we're doing on our on our podcasts. You know, me and Derek mm -hmm. and the other comrades at the at International Anti Colonial Institute is that we are bringing the pieces together to show what fits on this continent and what doesn't fit on this continent, right? Yeah. And that's the issue we're having. Oh, Derek, you had your your mic mute, unmuted. You have something to say? No, no, no. Go ahead. No, so I think that's that's the issue we have is that you know who are people going to trust about revolutionary theory? A white dude that's like 20 years old, right, Eddie, mm -hmm. from Midwestern Marks, or me, somebody that's 40 years old, has read this stuff. I have a law degree in Native American law, and it's a Marxist. Get out of here. You know, like, why would they trust Eddie? Why would Eddie be the face of anybody? Why would they trust Hinkle? But we have to understand there's another phenomenon, because I'm old enough mm -hmm. to ask Eddie where he was in 2016, right? Because I was old enough to remember and I was around during the Bernie movement. So during the Bernie movement, a lot of people became more interested in socialism, yep. right? So what happened was a lot of since since there's no real understanding of theory, a lot of these like you know newbies in politics, uh, they they scattered from the Bernie movement. Some of them actually became Trumpers because they yep. became anti-establishment. And some of them, some of them actually read the work. They actually read Marxist theories and they became, you know, principled Marxists. So that that movement built, you know, created a lot of different people. But the thing is, in my point of view, people like like um, Haas, Hinkle, and Midwestern Marx, they're ops to 
grab these people because if you Google socialism, mm. communism, the first thing that comes up are their platforms. And what they're doing is, is misdirecting new people that are interested in socialism into fascism. Well, that's a, right? that's an interesting thing is because like Johnny Socialism has pointed this out a couple of times. I pinged uh, ping Jackson Hanklin Hawes and I said, if you don't like these allegations, like actually address them is because number one, A, you're redefining Marxism, even the most basic like premises in Marxism, right? Without logical justification, you're basically involving yourself in some kind of patriotic socialism LARP and you just you, you basically redefine everybody. And then at the same time, you know, you basically, you know, engage in doxing and harassing behavior, which is effectively everything an op would do to be 100, like 100 percent honest with you. Yeah, but what, what's what's the best thing to do to deter a movement, deter revolution, is to create people to, to to get everybody that's new into politics, all these young people that are on the, that are on the internet, and misdirect them yep. into a uh, you know to into uh, settler colonial chauvinists, right? So fascism. I mean, they're, what they're doing is is moving people. It's like a factory moving them into into fascism because right now what they're doing in the same time. Is misappropriating, you know, like the popular movements right now. Mm -hmm. the, the popular movements online is the Palestinian resistant movements. So they're misappropriating that movement to get followers. Look how many followers Hinkle has had. Oh, how yeah. many how many news people have reposted Hinkle, right? But at the end of the day, a couple of weeks prior to that, uh, Hinkle's praising Netanyahu. You know, it's, yeah, Hinkle, like it's Hink John, Johnny Socialism pointed that yeah, out like pretty it, well. Yes, but you know, let me finish. So what's going mm -hmm. on is these is these fascists are saying, "Oh, if you speak against me, you're speaking against the other side." But that's not the case. What we're speaking of is when we critique them, it's not about you know their correct positions; it's their incorrect positions, their stellar colonial positions, their fascists, their their transphobia, their their bigotry, their homophobia, all these positions they have, their settler chauvinist, settler, I mean colonial chauvinist positions, these positions are meant to drive people, you know, because at any any moment these platforms can say, hey, we don't like this shit no more. We're going to yep. move over to fascism. And if, next thing you know, we have a bunch yep. of fascists in our hands. That's my hypothesis. That's my hypothesis. Is that like, you know how like a bunch of leftist Twitter accounts were getting uh, quote unquote uh, deleted uh, back in earlier, like January? And Tulsi Gabbard was talking about how X was like the platform of free speech. Like, uh, yeah, it's like, the thing is, I have a hypothesis is that they're waiting for Donald Trump to get elected and they're just going to start purging leftists on the internet. And the shitty thing is, is that as communists and as leftists, we don't have any like alternative media platforms to exist on. I mean, there's Odyssey. That's that's a decentralized platform. But, you know, the 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 right has built up Rumble. You know, they can take advantage of Kick. They have Cozy TV with Nick Fuentes. They have Truth Social. They have their own entire parallel media ecosystem. Where they can kind of exist on, even if they do get censored on the mainstream platforms. Who, like you said, who's to say these platforms don't just start censoring leftists? Which honestly, they already are. Uh, to be hundred percent honest, you, it's just not talked about. You know, it's ironic that you know the right are basically calling themselves the most oppressed political like minority, but you know they're not like they say that with like six hundred subs and like three thousand concurrent viewers, and uh, you know they're always going viral all the time. You know, I'm being censored. Help, follow me on Rumble before it's too late. You know. You see this kind of like it's almost kind of become a meme at the same time, right? They're basically a giant like crybaby complaining about being censored when they're really not. Yeah. So before I say, I move on, I do want to give I do want to give Derek a um chance to speak. I feel like we've been kind of like yeah. um pushing him aside. Derek, do you have anything to add? Yeah, that's all good. Um I mean I was gonna try and slide in at some point um that the 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 aspect of this is that these uh these guys like aren't an aberration. And uh, that's that's what I think they're most useful for for as a uh, to as a as a writing prompt for me um, or just like a, a topic of discussion. Like I, I think you could say that they are basically in line with most of the communist movements, not just in you could say in the Euro colonial sphere in general uh, of of white people, but like specifically even in the settler colonies um, this is something i like to point out a lot is that it, this has been a common theme across all of the settler colonies uh loisy uh, lushaba the the uh, commissar in the eff we were talking about earlier who's also a professor at university of cape town in south africa um he 
he does uh, everyone definitely like rick's saying like check out his lectures they're really good mm. um he studies epistemic colonialism um he's he talks about and a few other people uh, uh harry haywood in his book black bolsheviks uh black bolshevik talk about uh the racism in the communist party of south africa and then the the white uh communists in south africa mm. and the fact that they you know were you know you know they had they had a communist party but they're all chauvinists they're all cl uh colon colonizer nationalists um settler nationalists and this has been a, a recurring theme across the settler colonies in australia it's the same thing yeah you have the black people's union struggling with the communist party of australia because it's a white organization run by settlers who have a reactionary colonial line on the national question it's the same thing here and in canada uh it most uh i think what helps is what is very current is uh labor zionism that went into the creation of israel is actually like the the at, at a time it was the most popular political yeah uh political orientation of israelis was to be the labor zionists to be to talk you know they talk about nation building you know like these pat socks yep. do they talk you know they're talking about nation building but they don't really you know it's like it's not like they include palestinians in that or they're like you know or yeah. just that they they embrace you know the colonial national colonizer nationalism so it's like this has been a theme across all of the settler colonies we have that here if you read the party programs of the communist parties here in the United States, Canada, oh, and Mexico, they have the same uh, the same chauvinist lines uh, on the national question. That's not me saying that you shouldn't join these parties and line struggle against that. You know, that's that's could very well be worth a worthwhile strategy. Um, you know, we it, it's uh, there's a lot of strategies that you can take to try to help move these parties along because there uh there are people who have written about fanon wrote about this uh, a long time ago um uh, a dying colonialism i think fewer people have read that than wretched of the earth or even black skin white masks uh in in the dying colonialism he talks about the role that colon the positive role that colonizers can play in decolonization and that they did play in algeria um and yeah, that's just uh, it's when when you analyze all the settler colonies, you'll find this is a recurring theme. And although these Strasserites, uh, these Browderists, uh, Larucheites, although they yeah. you know do represent some sort of a niche hyper extreme version, um, they really are not an aberration. Still, like they are. Yeah, well, know, I mean, they, they they're in line with the mainstream of the white left. That's mm -hmm. just yeah. Like, I mean, I do have something to say. Go for really it. quick. Um, Derek brought brought up a point that I'm going to address together with my point right now. First off, is that the the left in the U.S. is very weak. Obviously, it's an imperial yeah. core, but theory wise, it's weak. This is why infrared, you know, Miss Western Marx are walking all over the the West. I mean, the Marxist the left, left in, yeah. in the left, right? It's yeah. because they they let's be real. Let's be real right now. Most settlers um, are are chauvinists, even though they're Marxists. They're so, you know they're colonial chauvinists because they don't understand the colonial theory. Just like me and Derek talk about me and other decolonial comrades, we read the party programs of like these you know like communist parties, you know whatever Marxist party. I don't want to I don't want to single out you know CPUSA, but you know we 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 read these Marxist parties, settler Marxist parties, part, party programs, and we read in, you know really bad takes. I mean it's really fucking bad. And some of the, some of these some of these party programs are talking about assimilating indigenous peoples and that's, that's furthering colonization. You know? So if they're doing mm -hmm. it and we're fighting like the ultra fascists, which is like you know, like the infrared, but we're also having to fight our comrades at the same time, right? It's fucking hard to be indigenous in the imperial core. <laughs> in a yeah, no, state. that's just yeah. So, but, but this brings up another aspect is that you know, you know, Alistair brought up that um, you know the right has a monopoly pretty much on media, right? But then now we we have to understand that you know the the left 
has you know all these platforms but they're ran by settlers right <laughs> and they themselves yeah. just like the parties have colonial chauvinist takes so yeah. this is why i have spoken out i guess people like rev left upstream that have come on my uh, upstream specifically has come on my platforms and has gone mad at me that, that i that i talk about seller colonization too much that's fucking outrageous. This is the largest leftist platform in the U.S. And they're telling people not to listen to me. What kind of shit is that? You know, these, these sellers are, are commodifying. They're exploiting revolutionary politics and simultaneously pushing out indigenous voices. It's fucking disgusting. So we had to now as decolonial Marxists, as indigenous people, we have to fight everybody. We do. It's honestly, we have to fight everybody. We have to fight infrared, Midwestern marks. We have to fight upstream, rev left. You know all these people because they, all of them are chauvinist. You know, and some of them that understand when we tell them you're chauvinist, we don't tell you we're chauvinist to tell you to attack you. No, we're telling you to correct yourself. I do want to give one example. So I met Matt Hunter. He's the one that debated Noah on the Midwestern mm -hmm. marks, right? And I met. Matt Hunter in person. And he fought with Derek right here, who's on the stream yeah. as well. He fought with Derek on Twitter because Derek called him. So, as you know, a show yeah. right? So what happened was, I, I mean, met... I told, I, 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 all I did was uh, point out that the, his, you know, the TPSA's National Party program yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. is like yeah. a two-state solution. Uh, it is. That's all I said. And he took it super personally. But so he's yeah. coming around on us. Yeah, but he came around. But that's that's the story I'm I'm telling. Is that is you know, I met with, with, with Matt. Matt actually came to a de what is decolonization, what is decolonial theory lecture. And I was watching Matt when I was giving this lecture. And Matt was really paying attention. And I gave him credit. And after the lecture, Matt came up to me and said, What do you recommend for reading? And I told him, I shit you not. Later that week, he sent me pictures of the recommended readings. He bought the books, right? He actually did the reading, right? So when he went into the debate with Midwestern Marx, he annihilated Noah, and that's what we need. That's why I thank Matt for what he did, right? That's the kind of comrades we need, right? And I support people joining Communist Party USA chapter in Los Angeles, Southeast Los Angeles, because I know he's a comrade, Right. And that that's what I'm talking about. We need more people like that. So that's what I want. That's what, why I'm promoting is for when we tell you you have chauvinist sticks, don't get mad at me. Fucking ask me how and fucking unfuck yourself. Right. That's what mm -hmm. you have to do to move forward into a, a liberated society, into a decolonial society, you know, where sellers and indigenous can live together. The end. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like how like the EFS kind of handling it because they even have like you know white South Africans like that were are basically poor in in the EFF like that like the whole stereotype that they're just genociding white people or it's just stupid stupid gentlemen I I have to go soon because I have a class because I'm I I'm it's deep, all good but I um I will stay for a couple more minutes and. Uh... Yeah, I think if we do a, a, a close out, I do want to say, yeah. so people that are listening, um, me me and Derek have platforms. Derek, um, you know, Derek has post-scarcity. There's the uh, Kanaka Ganda podcast is in Hawaii and, and uh, Marxist uh, uh, Kanaka indigenous from Hawaii. There's the Chunkaluda podcast, uh, Chunk Chunkaluda network, actually, right? And um, there's Sleeping Larry on Twitch. Uh, there is Radical Narrative in Canada. Another podcast. There's De I am decolonized Buffalo. I'm Rick from decolonized Buffalo, right? And please, like, listen to our, our our work. It's free. We don't charge anything like these. You know, seller podcasts do. We are giving you this information for free, so you can teach other people, so you can be better comrades. Mm. Derek, you, you have pay money to, to go to Jackson Hinkle's private, uh, private to get his private info, uh, private information that he provides. So basically, he'll share certain information with you, but only if you pay. Yeah, because he's not <laughs> he he's, he he still wants to make a buck out of it, right? Yeah. Derek, do you have anything to say before we leave? Oh no, just uh, I think you covered it all. Sorry if I'm really yeah. passionate, or you know, I'm kind of like excited. 
This is a very, very passionate subject for me. It's a good discussion. So, yeah, yeah, I really liked it. It's good to be. We've, it, it, we've yeah, I like to see the fire in your... I can't yeah. see your eyes right now, but I can imagine <laughs> that your eyes look like right now. Fire. Yeah, good yeah. discussion. I, I definitely got to see the other side of the aisle because, uh, you know, I, we only, I've only been bombarded with the Pat Sock aisle lately. Okay, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, we, we were on the other side of uh, a pretty <laughs> heated... Uh, it, it did get heated. That's why we're pretty passionate about this, because uh, they these people have like death threatened us and like oh my god, um, yeah, and yeah, just no, I... fed jacketed us. So Oof. yeah, this Psycho. is uh, Psycho stuff Psycho. we deal with pretty directly. Alrighty, alrighty, good discussion. Well, good discussion, guys. Have a wonderful day, and uh, I have to head to class now because I am a teacher. So yes, all right. You all have right, a good gentlemen. day. Have a good day. You have to you, know you have to upload the audio from your end, right? Yes, sir. I'll be I'll be doing. I can send it to you guys. No, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stay logged on until you download it. Cause I don't want to like you know accidentally not downloading it. So I'll be here until you're done. De okay. okay. So this is decolonized Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo. A uh, Derek and Comrade Confucius. We had a good discussion with it. Uh, yep. Yeah, I go follow them. They seem like pretty cool people. Okay. Goodbye, gentlemen. Till next time. Goodbye. Peace, peace. Bye.